Hi everybody and welcome back again to Professor Pastor Paul's Midweek Bible Festival. Before we get into our passage from the Gospel of John tonight, I uh, want to mention to you that starting next week we're going to have a four week series in the month of February about birds of the Bible. Now you know I'm a bird guy, so I'm going to bring in my little interest here, maybe spice it up a bit, talk about some birds. There's birds in the Bible. We're going to talk about them. Looking forward to that. Four weeks in February, and then we start Lent. But tonight, John chapter 1, verses 35 to 51. A little bit of a long reading. Hang with me. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth. Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to them, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pardon me for one moment. I'm going to get some water. Throat's a little dry. <clears throat> Here's a question. How does one become a Christian? And how does one remain? There are many possible answers to these questions. One answer, one possible answer is, you become a Christian by being raised in and living within a Christian family in a Christian society. Now, this answer is less popular in America than it used to be, but it is still quite popular in many, many places. And this answer, of course, kind of begs the question. But my point is that many people see being Christian as a cultural identity rather than a, relig a religious one. In this particular view, it's not so much about believing or doing certain things. You become and remain a Christian the same way you become and remain an American, say, or a Southerner, because you're born into it and you don't reject the label. That's one way, one meaning of the word Christian. Another way to become a Christian, perhaps, is by believing certain things. 
Maybe one of these is the divinity and humanity of Christ. Maybe one is the virgin birth. Maybe one is that Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior. Another might be that, the, that God is triune, three-parted, the Trinity. Or it may be your belief that the Bible is a literal document to be believed in the simplest, factual, physical way. All kinds of beliefs you could put out there. Orthodoxy, correct belief. Another popular answer to the question, how do you become a Christian, is you become and remain a Christian by doing things like serving the poor and reading the Bible and going to church. You do stuff. In other words, being a Christian in this, in this example is about what you do, not about what you believe. The term for that is orthopraxy as opposed to orthodoxy. Correct action. Orthopraxy as opposed to correct belief, orthodoxy. But for me, standing here in front of you, Professor Pastor Paul, I think that becoming a Christian happens when you make a conscious decision to follow Jesus, and remaining a Christian means keeping him in your sights as you go. Making a conscious decision to follow Jesus and keeping him in your sights as you go. That's how you become and remain a Christian. Now this answer disappoints some people because it's kind of vague, not so useful. There are few prescribed or universally held beliefs or actions associated with following Jesus. There's no way to make a litmus test out of it to see if somebody is appropriately following Jesus. There's no way to draw lines between in-groups and out-groups when following Jesus is your definition of being a Christian. Of course, for many, including myself, this is a great part of its appeal. Another appealing thing about defining a Christian in this way is that it seems to be biblical. And by that, I mean supported by Scripture. Jesus asked a lot of his followers but the first thing he ever asked of them, any of them, was follow me. That is his invitation, and it comes to folks in the Bible and to you and me over and over again. This week's text is about Jesus calling us to follow him and our responses to him and, our re and his responses to us. It's about following and Jesus' call to follow him. So the, the uh, drama opens on the day after Jesus' baptism. He was still out there in the wilderness hanging around with John the Baptist, maybe out by the Jordan, I suppose, I don't know. Wherever they were, John the Baptist was standing around with Andrew and an unidentified person when Jesus walked by and John pointed out and said, Look, here's the Lamb of God. There he is. And just like that, they follow Jesus. Andrew and the unidentified person. And Jesus didn't even ask them to. John said it. They believed it. Apparently on the strength of his word. They believe John as you would believe your teacher. This is often how things work. For example, uh, first time you ever were told that the earth is spherical and goes around the sun... It's probably because somebody in authority told you so. And you believed it because you had trust in them. Proving that the earth is round and goes around the sun is pretty tricky. You don't have any direct experience of that. But you believed it because somebody you trusted said so. And that's fine. Someone you trust, your parents, a friend, a teacher, points to Jesus of Nazareth and says, that's the Messiah. That happens. Well, that's the Messiah then because somebody I trust said so. A perfectly genuine way to start following Jesus. Perfectly good. Someone said so. Someone I trust said so. But eventually, you need to face Jesus yourself. Andrew and this unnamed person, this unnamed disciple, plan on meeting Jesus face to face, but Jesus turns to meet them first. 
turns and faces them, stops them in their tracks, and Jesus says, what are you looking for? Now, Jesus may know exactly what they're looking for. He probably does. But he knows the important thing is for them to verbalize it themselves. This is a very typical Jesus move, by the way. He does the same thing to Bartimaeus, who calls out to Jesus in Mark 10. In that story, the disciples lead Bartimaeus, a blind man begging outside of Jericho, to Jesus' feet. And Jesus asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Now, you know that Jesus knows what Bartimaeus wants him to do. But nonetheless, Jesus invites Bartimaeus to tell him, to speak. He respects the man's agency. He is doing the same thing in this passage. He, he, the two men take off after Jesus, and he turns to them and says, What are you looking for? You tell me. Again, he respects their agency. What are you looking for? This is Jesus' question to those men, and it is Jesus' question to us as well. In truth, the question haunts a little bit because it forces introspection. And I know my heart to be divided. What do I, what am I looking for? What is the answer to that question? My heart is divided. It's an honest question. Jesus asks them. He makes them ask it of themselves. This is one way Jesus comes to us. And every time that question comes to you, what are you looking for? Honestly, that, friends, is identical to the voice of Jesus. They end up staying with Jesus for that day. At some point, Andrew goes and finds his brother Simon, tells him they have found the Messiah, and brings Simon to Jesus. Now, this is great. Jesus takes one good look at Simon and changes his name to Peter. Pow! Just like that. You are not Simon, you are Peter. Jesus knows he has found his man. Now, there are a number of name changes in Scripture, and nearly all of them occur during encounters with God. Abraham, Abram becomes Abraham, Sarah becomes Sarai, Jacob becomes Israel, Saul becomes Paul. And here, Simon becomes Peter, the rock. When you meet Jesus on the road, friends, he might give you a new name, which means a new identity. Which sounds nice, but in my experience, it's very disorienting to lose an identity. I wonder how Simon felt about losing his old name, and I wonder how he felt about his new one. In any case, becoming and remaining a Christian means taking on a new identity and holding on to it. Not just a new set of beliefs or practices, but a new identity at the heart of who you are. The day after this, which is to say two days after Jesus' baptism, Jesus decides to go to Galilee. Along the way, he finds Philip, who is from Bethesda. Now, Bethesda is a city in Galilee, a nice town at the north end of the sea, and it is the same city that Andrew and Peter are from. So it's beginning to feel like the gang's all here, where everybody's getting together. But there's more. Philip goes and finds a fellow named Nathaniel and tells him, Nathaniel, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. Found him. Now I can imagine Nathaniel thinking, oh boy, who is it? Which great leader or military hero or well-connected social darling could it be? And where are they from? Bethesda, Jerusalem, Jericho, Capernaum? Philip answers, it is Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. What a letdown. Can anything good come out of Nazareth, Nathaniel asks. What a question. Like he's saying, whoa, if I'm going to follow this so-called Messiah, he needs, to better have, he needs to have a better resume than this. Nazareth, what a dump. 
And it's true, honestly, Nazareth was a tiny, little-known place tucked away in an inconspicuous corner of Galilee, and those who knew of it had no respect for it. Again, we get a glimpse of the upside-down world of Scripture, which is to say the upside-down upside world of God. The last are again, again, made first. In Jesus of Nazareth, God once more shows up in the invisible, the unnoticed, the marginalized, the ones from whom no one expected anything at all. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Overall here, the point seems to be Jesus is not what we expect. So when you decide to follow him, you are choosing to be surprised, friends. When you follow Jesus, you are landed out there and saying, I'm willing to be surprised. Surprises are not always happy things. But Nathaniel is surprised when he finally catches up with Jesus. Jesus, when he sees Nathaniel coming over the horizon cries, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit about Nathaniel, who just kind of badmouthed Jesus. Jesus is now saying a really nice thing about him. An Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Stop short, apparently recognizing the description. Must be me. Nathaniel says, where did you get to know me, Jesus? Jesus said, well, nowhere really, but I did see you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Thing is, Jesus knows us, friends. He knows us by name. He recognizes us. He picks us up out of a crowd. He tells us the truth about ourselves. Such a man can only be the Messiah, and Nathaniel knows it. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel, he declares. And in response, Jesus promises him that he will see greater things than this in the future. So long as he follows him, keeps an eye on him, and declares him for who he is. Follow me, and you will see great things. You will also be surprised. You will also have the truth told. It will be an adventure, and adventures aren't always easy. That's what being a Christian is. It's an adventure. Trying to keep up with Jesus. Not easy. But to be a Christian is to follow Jesus, and to follow Jesus is to trust in exactly the same way that Andrew and the unknown disciple trusted. To follow Jesus is to speak up simply and in truth about what one is looking for. Tell the truth. Also, as Andrew and the unknown disciple did. To follow Jesus is to lose your old identity in order to gain a new one, as Peter did. To follow Jesus is to be open to the unexpected, to the reality that he may not be who you think he is, or who you think he should be, just as Nathaniel did. And following Jesus means being surprised by the simple fact that Jesus already knows us, just as Nathaniel did. No one, friends, is anonymous to Jesus. No one is anonymous to Jesus. Amen. Hope everyone is having a good week. Stay warm. I miss you. Hope to see you Sunday. And remember, next week, start off the birds of the Bible. See you then.